going to warn you now about next year. With everything, all the transitions, I didn't bring this on you next, but next year I will. It is my tradition on Thanksgiving morning to have a worship service at the church at 8 o'clock in the morning with Holy Communion. I don't expect everybody to be here, and it's usually a small crowd. But we start the day singing and praising God because too often we are so busy on the day our nation sets aside to give thanks to God that we do everything but give thanks to God. Or we say the quickie prayer because somebody's already dug into the sweet potatoes. Whoops, 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 we got to pray. we got to stop and pray. So this morning, I want us to think about Thanksgiving as we hear both the lessons we've heard already, and this one comes from the Sermon on the Mount, from the sixth chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 25. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They never sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've been unpacking my house and even my office to some extent because some of my books have been sitting around in boxes. And the folks who helped me pack sort of labeled my boxes as theology books and regular books. Regular books are everything from things I had in college to history to cookbooks. But I got here and I opened a, book that, a box of books called theology books and on top of something called the cake bible. They saw the word Bible and assumed it was theology. <laughs> but I was unpacking another box and I came across a study guide that I hadn't read in years and it made me stop and remember and give thanks. It was written by Deidre Crewald, who was a professor of Christian education at Wesley Seminary. She happened then to be the only ordained woman on the faculty at Wesley Theological Seminary. I met Deidre when she was probably in her 50s and married to Jim Crewald, who was an organist and played for the choir at Wesley in my last year there. But it wasn't until I read the study book that she wrote called Hallelujah Anyhow that I found out she had been married before. She was ordained in the United Methodist Church as a woman in the early 1970s. There were not a lot of women pastors in those days. I didn't realize that her first husband was also a United Methodist pastor. And her first husband and Deidre had taken the youth group from their church on a mission trip to Mexico. She was staying where they were camping out, preparing dinner for the group. Her husband was driving a truck with the entire youth group in it. And as they came around a mountain road, they were hit head on and they went over the side and her husband and every one of the teenagers died. She was in her 20s. And this was in the 1970s. Can you imagine what it was like to call the United States State Department from a town with no telephone service? And to contact the parents of all those children while you're grieving the loss of the love of your life. She thought about leaving the ministry. And how she healed herself was by sitting down with the Bible and looking up every time that Jesus got angry. And Jesus did get angry a few times along the way. And then she immersed herself in the Psalms, where the psalmists cry out in their anger and their frustration 
their fear, and their brokenness to God. But you know what happens in almost every psalm there is? We come back to a time of praise. We read a psalm this morning very much like that. By the rivers of Babylon, there we hung up our harps, our lyres, our musical instruments. Because how can we sing God's song in a foreign land? Especially when others are taunting us. Our captors are demanding us to sing them our holy songs so they can laugh at them and say, look what your God has allowed to have happen to you. You belong to us now. So sing and laugh and dance, Hebrew people. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? It's not always easy to be thankful, is it? Because sometimes our thankfulness does depend on our happiness. And like I tried to tell the kids who were squirming and wiggling because they were seeing themselves on the big screen and thinking about Christmas coming and Thanksgiving this week, it's hard sometimes to focus on what is happening right in front of us. But here we are called to be thankful, not to be happy. Happiness depends on what is going around you, right? If you had a good breakfast this morning, you're probably happier than the people who ran out the door and they're sitting there hoping that no one can hear their stomach growling from the next pew. But happiness does not have a lick to do with what is happening in your life at the moment. I mean, happiness has everything to do with that. Joy has nothing to do with that. Joy is the presence of God in the midst of our sorrow and our brokenness and our loss and our pain. So I want you to think this Thursday about the joy that's in your life. Jesus talks about this a lot in his Sermon on the Mount, where he's telling the disciples not to worry. Does anyone else in here have a problem with worrying? Because that is my greatest theological failing. I'm a worrier. Has it added any time or joy to your life to worry? I can tell you it doesn't do a thing for gray hair but make more calm. Jesus says don't worry because worrying is what other people have to do because worrying is about measuring your life by what you have or you don't have whereas faithfulness is about measuring your life by what you do have. Worrying is about what you don't have because if you don't have the toy you want for Christmas the socks and underwear aren't going to seem like much of a consolation are they? Paul talked about this in his letter to the Philippian church. He's writing to a church in a city that does not have a lot of Jews in it, but that has a lot of money and affluence. He's writing to people who have learned to measure their lives by their wealth and their importance. And he says to them, I'm going to tell you a secret. It's not about what you have or you don't have, because in all circumstances, if you have God in Jesus Christ, you will have more than you need, because what did he say at the end? If you don't know any other line from the letter to the Philippian church, you know this one. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him that strengthens me. That's not about saying I can do what I want. I can win the lottery. I can get a new car. I can get the pony for Christmas under the tree. It's about saying that in Jesus Christ, through good times or bad times, you are aware of the presence of God, which is the sustaining force in your life. And with God, no matter what you've gained or lost, you will have all that you need. I was blessed that my seminary professor, Deidre Crewald, did not leave the ministry because she had more of an impact on my life, I think, than most of the other professors I had. If you took one of her classes, you worked harder than you did in any other class because she made you practice what you were going to preach. She made you put together Bible studies. She made you put together lesson plans. She convinced me in a class on literacy to go door to door in Baltimore City and knock on doors and ask people if I could go in and talk to them about helping their children learn how to read. It was amazing to me that people opened the door to me and let me in and told me about their pain. Because Deidre learned through her pain that it is a way that we connect with each other because we have all known times of loss and grief and hurt and sorrow. But those of us who know Christ know how to get through those times. We know to be thankful in all circumstances because this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. And I know lately, I've talked a lot about my husband and it's getting to be the holiday time. 
And so the thought of going through another Thanksgiving and Christmas without him is hard for me. And I was going to share with you to close this morning's time with you a quote from Mother Teresa. I had a good one, too. But I'm going to share with you a quote from Richard Nelson Howington, my husband. He found out in September that he had multiple system atrophy type C, something most people have never heard of. He found out that at best he had eight years to live, and they were going to be a very difficult, painful eight years, years as he lost more, uh, more of his function. Both his autonomic systems, those things that you do without thinking about them, your heartbeat, your respiration, your blood pressure, not to mention all the other indignities that came along with this. And he was also going to lose some of his mental facilities, which he did. And I remember going to church, leaving him at home after we had sat there and talked about what this meant. I went to church, and I sat outside the church, and I called my mother. And I am not a crier. And I sobbed and screamed into the phone to her about what was happening. And I went home, and he looked at me, and he said, I have had some time to think. And this is what I've come up with. I've had a very good life. And he added then, being married to you is the best part of it. We'd only been married for eight years when he was diagnosed. And we'd only been married for six years when he was diagnosed. He said, if I get more life, I will be grateful. But if this is all I have, I will not stop being grateful to my God. And I'm the ordained one in the family. That is what it means to claim that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can stand here and continue to preach the gospel of my resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in spite of everything I've lost because I will not measure my life by what I have lost. I will always measure my life by what I have gained in Jesus Christ. My forgiveness, my peace, my consolation, my promise of everlasting life in the world that will have no end. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if there is no other reason than that to say, thank you, Lord God, I will say thank you, Lord God, until my final breath. May this week bless you. May this week bring you together with those you love around a table. May this week give you more football than you know what to do with, if that's your thing. But may this week remind you of all for which you have to be thankful. And may you express that freely and joyfully. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. May that be your uplifting message that you carry with you, not from me. But that's one that's going to get you through so many things. Amen.